I am excited to announce that we have partnered with the Outdoorsman's in Fountain Hills, Arizona. They can provide all of your optics needs along with some of the best machine tripods and mounting accessories in the business. Swarovski, Zeiss, Leica, Leupold, binoculars, spotting scopes, rifle scopes, you name it. They can provide it and at the industry's most competitive prices. They are offering our listeners an exclusive offer on all Outdoorsman's manufactured products such as packs, tripods, tripod heads, and other gear they manufacture. At checkout, type in the discount code RNA15, that is RNA15, and you will receive a one-time 15% off your order. Please go to Outdoorsman's.com and use the discount code today. Thank you for the support. How you doing? You good? Ah, good, good. Good, good. Yeah. No America. That karaoke session last check, night was check. pretty damn good. I had a good time at it. <clears throat> what do you think? Are we sounding good? Karaoke. We're sounding good. We're there, we're there. Yeah. We're there. We're in it. We're in it. This is it. We're going live. Three, two, one. Oh my god, there's a screaming child. All right. Wrapping up. September 13th. No, we're flying back a day early. It's 12. September 12th. We are four hours and 41 minutes out of Los Angeles International Airport. Back to Cali, Cali, Cali. Yeah, we're what? Nine days ago, we were sitting here doing this. Head to Istanbul to Kyrgyzstan. Yeah. Crazy. Dude. Does, doesn't feel like nine days ago, does it? No. On one hand, it feels like less than that, but on the other hand, it feels like a long time ago. Yeah. Get that. As all these trips, it seems like they always feel like they go by so fast, but then when you think back on it, like how much we did in that time frame, <laughs> it's like, wow. We, we conquered some stuff, that's for sure. We conquered some mountains, that's <clears throat> for damn sure, man. Yeah. Well, our, our up, what's that? That's just depressive. Yeah. How much... How much we covered, not only how much how many miles we've flown, but miles driven, and miles hiked, miles hiked and at twelve thousand plus. Oh, it's ridiculous, crazy. Yeah. It was so funny that day that uh, one of the packers was like, "Justin, Justin, I'll wear your pack," and <laughs> he takes Justin's pack and he's like, "Oh wait, this is way too heavy." <laughs> This is way too heavy. He's slowed, not even slowed hunting. Slowed him down a little bit. Yeah. Slowed him down a lot of bit, man. A lot of bit. Yeah, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't an easy, easy feat up in those hills, man. Yeah. A little crazy, huh? A little elevation. We talked about that, I know, when we were on the mountain, but just how crazy that elevation was and how it could... Definitely take the wind out of your lungs kind of the first, you know, the first couple days in, that's for sure. Yeah. I mean, I was struggling the first. I was struggling breathing the whole time, but. <laughs> I'm right there with you. I was uh, definitely, like, seriously struggling. Wake, wake up, up every up. morning, look up at the, uh, look up at the surrounding mountains, and in my head, I was like, uh, there ain't no way we're going up there. And two hours later, we'd, we'd spot Billy's, and uh, we'd be up there. Would be on the top. Yep. yep. This so. is what I'm showing for five days of hunting, mileage wise. That's based on my averaging watch, 11 but. miles a day. Yeah. That's not bad. 10 to 11 miles a day. Some days were longer. Some days were eight, nine miles. But in, on average, on foot miles. Yeah. Yeah. That's a pretty good jaunt. In yeah. Five especially days, especially with the elevation gain. Yeah. Yeah. 55.5 miles in five days. That's good work. <laughs> There's a little bit of horseback riding in there, which is nice. There was a little bit of a reprieve from getting off the legs and the knees and the packs and jumping on a horse. But 
you know, jumping on a horse has its fatigue level too, right? I mean, your your shins from holding your boots and the stirrups, your thighs, your legs from kind of clenching the saddle. I mean, I noticed my knees, knees too. Yeah. yeah, my knees would kind of get tight if we ex- rode for an extended period of time. But sometimes I just would rather get on my feet and walk versus get on a horse. But it sure was nice having the horses, though. No question. Yeah, so I guess when we left off, we were just packing up camp. We're getting ready to pack up camp the next morning. Correct. And move. Yeah, you and I both had shot one Ibex, and uh, we were in the process of packing up and going what one canyon over, I think is what the plan was. And Yeah, that night we did the podcast. We were just kind of hanging out, just, you know, enjoying the evening, didn't hunt that evening. And the next morning, got up early, broke down camp, and uh, headed uh, headed over to the next canyon, which, as we got to that saddle at the top of the canyon, it got pretty interesting, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, it did. Yeah, man. Well, they spotted those billies. And that that band, would they say there was five studs in that band? Five of the 11, I think, total? Yeah. Yeah, yeah which was, I mean, I looked at, I, I fell in love with one of them, you know, like, beautiful beautiful arc and its horns and on its left side it just instead of wrapping around and coming back it just kicked way out to the left and it's just such a beautiful animal to look at and it's so unique yeah you know, it was interesting about that group is we were higher than them so when we came up to kind of that saddle that ridge you know we would stay back on the horses and the guides would hop off and walk up over and before they go we'd go skyline and they'd always look and i remember that reaction of seeing you know our two guides go up there kind of crawl up there and then immediately crawl back down and you know give us the you know kind of the universal sign of hey we got ibex the universal sign of language barrier exactly <laughs> yeah but i don't know about you guys but every time that would happen my heart would start pumping oh yeah, yeah. you know and I'd shot my Ibex the day before. I knew it was Annie's turn, so it was like, man, I'm, I, I was, my heartbeat was racing like I was a shooter knowing that Andy was up, you know, and it, yeah. it's just exciting every time. We'd come over a bluff, and there'd be like, boom, there'd be like 10, 15 Ibex here. You yeah, know? well, and that's actually a really good point, dude, is like when um, you went on your stock and they told me to, to stay back, and I'm staying back, and I went and was just watching you from a, from I don't know about a mile away or whatever it was the entire time the amount of intensity that was going on for me watching you close the gap and, and get in there to take your shot like that's exactly what was going on it was yeah. just like so intense heartbeat racing you know like yep really yeah. in it you're excited for you know who's under the gun you're excited for everyone in the situation that we're gonna get an opportunity to go and you know in this case where we were at it was i think we figured about a seven eight hundred yard shot it was mm-hmm. probably what we could have closed the distance on you know yeah. and there was decisions not to do that right or wrong but i know you had some oh i was like married to that animal yeah you were i, I wanted were, that animal yeah there was no question <laughs> <laughs> but what's interesting is, is we're sitting there kind of making a plan B, and we look almost, what, a mile and a half, two miles off to what would have been, I guess, our west, and there's another band of 11 or 12 that had an absolute stud in it. Giant. Biggest one we saw all, all five, six days. The owner of the outfit, when we got back, remember he walked up to the dinner table, and he was like, so who missed the who missed the big one? Right? Yeah. Ugh. Painful. Yeah painful but yeah we we spotted that band and the guides were like we're gonna go down here we're going after these ones we're gonna leave these ones alone and i was you're pretty worked up i was pretty worked up about it i really was like dedicated to shooting this one billy that we had found and uh we did some uh scree slides and went down the canyon and kind of set up a little area where camp was going to be Yep. And uh, let those billies rest, the, the ones that were about a mile and a half away. And started making a plan, and after we had some lunch, we took off up the mountain after them. And that, <clears throat> that whole process, 
going up that ravine, and then staying on horseback and cutting around the tip of the mountain. Well, you're looking down and you're like, wow, that's three or four hundred feet. Yeah. And you're on top of a horse. On shale. On shale. Feet are kind of like, kind of making it through, but sliding. And yeah. I'd call it a little butt puckering. Yeah. On the saddle. <laughs> Just yeah, a little I bit. Up, uh, I ended up getting off at one point. It is, uh, yeah, butt clenching, that's for sure. Yeah. You weren't really feeling it. I wasn't feeling it, no. And I had a... Uh, what I consider a pony. At you had the, time. the super horse, <laughs> <laughs> a little pony that kept uh, kept falling and tripping on his face. So I didn't feel too comfortable riding on that stuff. Yeah, that was a little tiny guy. It was. It was. He's cute though. Poor guy had to swim across the river on the way back too. <laughs> he did well. He did well. It was uh, it was training week for him. <laughs> right. Oh man. It was an intense ass week for that fellow. <laughs> oh. No lack of uh, no lack of fun or excitement the mm-hmm. whole time. But you're right. I mean, we we literally climbed straight up from where we set kind of a, a camp for the evening, scooted around that, that shell face, and then popped up, and we got to that little saddle again. And, uh, of course, sure enough, our guides go up a little higher than us and spot the Ibex. And I think when I arranged them, they were like 989 or 998 or something, something more. It was a 1,000-yard shot, right? Yeah. You were thinking, okay, maybe I can make that shot, but... I think the guides were thinking after a couple of days of watching us shoot, thinking we need to get them closer, you yeah. know, and, and yeah. realistically, you know, we could probably make a thousand yard shot with your rifle, but it was a little windy on the hill. And so they've kind of put a plan together and uh, they well, not, got us pretty damn close. Not only that, but like when they went up there and then they came back and they're like 700 yards, I was instantly infuriated because I was like, well, 700 yards was the shot on the on the rant or on the on the billy i fell in love with like let's go back and make that shot i don't want you know like yeah i haven't even had a good look at this one yeah the problem with them calling out yardage is is i don't i think they didn't really know how to use our our spot our our range finding systems Yeah. yeah and then they got to the point where you know they were getting pretty trigger happy with the with the range finder button and they actually wore my battery down which kind of became an issue at one point resolved on that but, day but became an issue when we got you in close yeah um, but uh yeah they, so they kind of devised a plan and we took off and went around the back side of the mountain and uh cut through a little gap dove down the back side and came up and we came up we we're at 369 370 yards was it yep yeah yeah yeah, and let yeah. me literally crawled up and got you set up, and the guys were there. Of course, they're they're chattering, right? Yeah. And they're saying big, and they're doing, you know, they're giving you the universal sign for big, and and you spotted them initially. I think when you put your scope up, you're like, hey, is it the lower left one? And I just confirmed. I said, let me look. I looked at all of them, and there's no question. Yeah. After I screened all of them, there was one other good Billy in there, but there was that was clearly. Clearly, the giant. The giant. And yeah. uh, they were What they say? It was like 135 to 138 centimeters. That's what they figured. Yeah, yeah. it was It was, It was. was big. He was right? big. And uh, so I go and I start trying to range, you know, the animals, and I get my first range. It works. After that, I'm having problems with it. And then it starts giving me calculations in meters. I'm saying, what the heck? So I grab my phone i started looking at my phone i've come to find out you can manually change the settings on those geobits too if you hold one of the buttons for two seconds it'll run i think that's what happened because all the settings were jacked up from what i had set on the profile of your rifle yeah so it took me about a minute 30 seconds to a minute to get connected got it together but during that time part of the problem was is they were talking there's a little bit of movement happening and one of well, the there's, billies there's six guys at 370 yards yeah on on a ridge line yeah and one of the billies got up and as we know in those situations because we all had it we had this nice calm situation where the animals weren't bugged or you know doing whatever all of a sudden one sees one and then next thing you know they're all getting up you start to feel pressure right like shoot i got to get under the gun and shoot like quick got to the range and and uh you know and i tried to get settled yeah you know my everything that was that was going on for me in that shot 
I was worked up from the, the one that I wanted to shoot and was forced to pass on. Um, every few seconds, like what you were saying, they were, they were talking back and forth. One of them would touch me and then tell me to shoot the big one or, or try to explain something to me in very poor English Yeah. while I'm behind the scope. <clears throat> and then that one got up, which Correct. took my, my, my pressure level to like 10,000. Yeah, because um, you're trying to settle and figure out what you want to do, and next thing you know, they're talking to you to tell you to do things. But one of the things you talked about is how you could kind of tune some of that out. If yeah. You knew I was there. I was giving you ranges. I was giving you, you know, hey, thought process stuff. You could kind of tune that other stuff out a little bit. Yeah. You know? Definitely. On on that on that shot, dude, it was almost impossible for me to tune it out just because there was, you know, there was the guy on the other side of you, two guys to the left of me, instead of you know, yeah, a small a smaller group or yeah. whatever it was, it made it really difficult. And uh, anyways, I I got lined up and I had half of the uh, the ridge line, the grass line that we were on, and my reticle. So I'm sort of looking through blades of grass at this big one, and I I line up on him and I'm trying to get comfortable and kind of awkward uh, laying situation. Because you were in prone on your pack, right? Yeah. Shooting. Yeah. And um, what happened? Well, the one Billy got up and the kind one, of started yeah. to move. Yeah, he, he got up, started to move. And once that kind of happened, I rushed the shot, you know, and, and immediately, like, I was on him, looking at him, trying to calm my breathing, really worked up, also watching the other one kind of scamper off. He turned his head and started looking and watching the other one, you know, look, yeah, move away. And uh, I sent it, and I sent it about a quarter inch over his fucking back. Right over his back, <laughs> just barely. <laughs> and followed it up with two other shots that were, there's just no way I was leading him by enough at, you know, 375 yards to make an accurate shot on him. Yeah. Where I thought I was, but it just wasn't happening. Yeah. Well, I think after the first shot, you get rattled, right? So yeah. you, you, dr you rack another one, you shoot, you're a little behind them, and then you shoot again, and then you're, you know, then you're, your magazine holds three, you're down three, they're still running. Yeah. You're you're frustrated, you're freaking out. I, I was in that situation the day before. So, um, yeah, it sucks. I mean, what, I mean, what better scenario, laying prone, bedded, sitting there, right? Yeah. If it's you and me hunting, we go up there, we're quiet, we get on that ridge, <laughs> we set it up, right, hey, and we're, we're talking low. These guys are tapping you, yeah. doing this, and big one, and they're looking at you, and the big one in it, so it, it's a different, it's a different stress, it's a different pressure that we don't feel when we're hunting by ourselves. And, or with a buddy. Yeah, and I, I, we'll get to my last hunt later, but it was just the three of us. Mm -hmm. I had a different level of, of, of calmness in that last shot I took yeah. not having them there yeah. and we'll get to that later but it just goes to show that that this hunt um, for a lot of different reasons it's very challenging not only the elevation but dealing with you know our guides for five days that really don't speak English you know it's a huge language barrier and we kind of figured things out and, you know we could animate but still we got way better by day five. Yeah. It got way better by day five. But I was saying the heat of the moment, like it's one thing sitting around the eating lunch and joking with each other. It's another thing in that moment when your your heart's racing, your adrenaline's pumping, and you got to make the shot, right? Yeah. And then things start happening and they move. And so it, it it's hard to put it into words how to do that. Do you have to go pee again? What are you saying? Are you kidding no, me? Gotta... Right in the middle. Here. We have uh, technical difficulties here. <laughs> As most of you probably know or don't know, we're sitting on an airplane. If you yeah. didn't know that, then, uh, well, you do now. You could probably hear the background noise. <clears throat> oh, anyway, so. Yeah, so, I mean, you, you know, you sent one high, you sent a couple more out of missed. 
we were all sitting there all you know like feeling I was more feeling bad for you than anything I I knew that well you'd watched the build up since that morning correct so you kind of knew where I was at mentally yeah. walking into this yeah. already and you were you were pretty I would say you were pretty defeated at that point I mean yeah. you were stressed you were defeated is a really good word yeah you were unhappy you didn't get an opportunity at the other one and then um, followed up with that experience so you know, that was our whole day essentially was was those two bands and and uh, you know after the shot we kind of sat there for a while and tried to calm the nerves a little bit but uh, I knew I didn't know exactly what you were feeling inside but of anyone on the mountain I knew how you were feeling I, and uh, <laughs> that's why I didn't I didn't poke the bear I didn't do anything I knew where you were at I didn't need to say anything yeah. you know that's just a well but also man you did a really good job of of just like hey you know talking me through it mentally and and you know just reminding me like hey we still got time yeah we're still good yeah no big deal well, water other, off a duck's back the other thing in my mind was is okay it was a clean miss you know yeah we didn't cripple this giant and hopes that we weren't going to retrieve him right i mean yeah you, you, it was a clean miss and so of anything we all know you'll sleep a little bit better at night knowing that you missed him clean versus you you know you hit him in the guts and once you once you cripple an animal that that exemplifies everything times three so yeah that'll really wear you out it sucks what happened but um i was i was i was trying to be positive and telling you hey man we missed it's clean miss let's go find another one yeah and that was the beauty of our hunt was anytime we got on some didn't make it happen missed whatever we were back on Ibex. In a couple hours. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or the next morning, right? If yeah. it was later in the day and the next morning, they were right back on them. And, and we went and kind of went back to where we originally parked the horses, went back up on that knob and sat. And we did spot, you know, three nice Ibex up on the far mountain yep. the next morning, which became kind of important to our story because that, the that kind of led us into the next morning. But that day we... We sat up there, and I think the guides just kind of figured, hey, let's go down. Let's go back to camp. Um, let's just, you know, they were they were a lot of times they like, because I think they thought we were kind of worn down a little bit. Let's go back. They'd give us that universal sign of camp. Mm -hmm. And we did. We went back to camp, and, um, you know, they made the decision that uh, we were going to just stay one night and then break camp the next morning because they felt like a lot of the Ibex had pushed back into the area that they thought we'd blown them out in. So, yeah. Which that actually was a kind of a nice night for me. I didn't even, I mean, I, I didn't want to put my sleep or my yeah. whole sleep system up. I just put my sleeping bag out and uh, slept under the stars, which was a, it was actually just an amazing night. It wasn't too cold. Like it was, it was yeah. cold. Don't get me wrong, but yeah. it wasn't too cold. It was really nice. Every time I woke up for a second, you know, here I am laying under the stars in Kyrgyzstan, just like. Yeah. Milky Way, everything is popping. There is With the no, horses too, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I was laying. I was laying on the ground. And the guys were giving me shit. You know, they're like, you're going to freeze, you know, in, in broken English. And, you know, oh, there's bears out here. A bear's going to come and get you. Like, they're trying to hide me up. And I'm laying there. And in the dark, I see this monster figure slowly creeping up to me and it was like I don't know 10 feet from my feet <laughs> making like a weird sound so I I went straight up to a sitting position and while I did it I was like <laughs> I heard that in my tent <laughs> didn't you have ear flex I did too and I still heard all that because I could even hear the horse eating yeah because it was that close and uh all the guys where they were they all came by and gave you crap didn't they because i heard them laughing oh yeah they thought it was the funniest thing on planet earth <laughs> <laughs> it was fun though like yeah you know well and i'll say that evening we sat around and, and had dinner with the guys and the guides and you know we kind of had our own meals and they had we were all kind of sharing a lot of stuff but yeah that was a fun night because we just we, we got to each night I felt like progressively we got to know them better like 
some of them were married, had families. Some of them weren't. Yeah. We knew their ages. Like, they were asking us questions, and, and uh, we started talking about music and all different just crazy kinds of stuff. And uh, Oh, yeah, that was the J-Lo night. Yeah, that was J-Lo. But it was, like, weird because when there's certain things you can connect on, you go back to that, right? Mm-hmm. They all they all like Jennifer Lopez. Well, she's, you know, we see, you know, we, yeah, J-Lo, we know who she is. So <laughs> you could connect with them on that level, you know, and versus talking about other stuff that they couldn't really understand so we would always kind of i would say maybe migrate back to certain conversations with them that they could understand but all of them ended up being pretty funny because you know they're just a bunch of guys in camp i mean you know how it is in hunting camp with a bunch of guys well and they're a really well experienced talk. guides yeah. too for yeah. for hunting ibex no question yeah i mean one of the comments i was putting some notes down on my phone on this flight just feedback you know both both constructive criticism and and good things and you know one of the things i wrote in there was is the kind of the relentless pursuit of our guides to want us to succeed Mm -hmm. like i've never had a guide push a mountain and walk four or five miles just to push an animal yeah like they've done like yeah or like say continuously get us on horses get us walking back into an area to find more ibex like we could have we could have not wanted to shoot any of them and they would have continued to roll a mountain, another mountain and find us more ibex yeah because i don't feel like there was one time when we found ibex where there wasn't one there was there was the one that ran by us at like 200 yards yeah by himself by himself that no one would have shot yeah but but we had a whole other plan that day, right? Yeah. And that was to kind of bring them over from that other side that, that our guide had, <laughs> had walked all the way up that ridge to the snow line mm-hmm. to try to push them. I mean, I, yeah, can't enough can't be said about those guys and, and uh, setting us up to succeed like they did. Yeah. You Great know? people. Funny, too. <laughs> Hilarious. All different personalities. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, it was just a fun evening. I mean, like I said, we talked about a lot of different things. We kind of we were listening to music. We were kind of DJing back and forth, different music. It just, it was fun. You know, we weren't really separated. I felt like some nights it was like us eating and them eating, right? Mm-hmm. We were having our own conversations. And as the as the days went on, we kind of shared all our meals with them all the time. And they were fast at cooking. They got everything done really well. Like, yeah. I mean, mind you, we're just eating basically cups of noodles but yeah when they're making food but still like you know we heard feedback man it takes hours to eat every night blah 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 it was like we were eating within 15, every 20 minutes yeah. they had some appetizer type snacks out um they cook ibex yeah you know we have, the ibex actually was so delicious man i was surprised yeah i wasn't expecting it to be as good as it was and part of why i was surprised is is i mean it was boiled so mm-hmm. they basically took chunks of like brisket and boiled them and then um you know cut them into little you know bite-sized chunks and and they were they were good i mean it was like a really only form of good raw protein you know the the entire trip trip was was the ibex meat but um, that's because we weren't gonna eat the canned sardines that's true (laughs) oh Dude, they were crushing those cans like nobody's business. Oh my god! They were probably so happy that they, they were getting more. They kept they kept asking. I think at one point they'd just open them and they'd set them down because they knew we wouldn't eat them. Yeah. And then they'd mop up all the juice with the bread. It's just like oh. all homemade bread. Great. Yeah, the bread. The bread's probably what kept me going. All those carbs. But um, yeah, just super fun night and. Um, you know, we woke up the next morning early. We broke down camp. We got the horses loaded up. And um, we started kind of working back up the same trail we'd come down the day before. And things got pretty interesting We got on that quick. band of 11 again. Correct. That we'd seen the day before that I married to that one. And started making a stock. Yeah. And I, I was excited. I was like, all right, now I'm going to get my my redemption on the one that i want yep like i saw this this is the one that i want yep and uh, it actually ended up being a pretty technical stock yeah because we were gonna have to open face you know in line of sight get in on them and i felt like a line too yeah single file line down like we were a, a small band of billies walking up the canyon towards them yeah i think when i ranged they were 
around between seven and 800 yards from where we got off the horses. Mm -hmm. And we just, like I said, literally got on that, that side of that, that mountain or that face of that mountain. And we just walked single file, heads down, and just moved towards them literally as they were feeding. And they were kind of feeding up towards away from us. But, you know, we were, we were closing the gap on them. And uh, as luck would have it, as mornings were, yep. you look up on top of the skyline, what do you see? There's a billy. There's one, and then another one, and then another one. Yeah. We, I think you brought up a good point. It was probably those three that we had seen. And the rocks the, the night rocks before. The rocks the day before. Yeah. Yeah. So that kind of obviously changed our plan um, significantly because those played right into our 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 hunt essentially and and uh and there were you know there were all of them looked good all three of them looked good from from a distance away so like the guides kind of made the decision that let's go up after them and, and they were uh, close too it was like three or four hundred yards yeah i think at one point they were a little over 400 and uh, they kind of came back around we didn't stop we stopped and waited for them to clear the one side of that ridge and that's when we started going up at them yeah and there was a little plateau up there and they ended up just i think maybe they had seen the horses in the valley below and kind of just held up where they something were. but you spotted them yeah and we lost them and then you spotted them and immediately when you pointed up i put my binoculars up and as well as things when i put my binoculars up they're right there you were about 10 yards in front of me yeah so in my mind i was already kind of calculating okay it's an incline so I shot the I shot the um, the yardage and it was 340 adjusted down to 310. Well, that was from where I, Justin and I were at. I knew that you were about 10 yards in front of me. That's why I told you. I said, "Hey, hold at 300. That's that's going to be the perfect range." The hard part was is he was front on with you. He was looking straight at you. Yeah. Right. He couldn't really get a good look. We knew there were two other ones in there, but that one was at 300. Yeah. And um, yeah. And it was kind of a similar setup because he he finally front quartered a little bit to the left, and it was a similar setup to my first shot. And as soon as he did that, it was just like, all right, you know, got ready, took my breath, boom, slammed him. And hard in the shoulder. Hard in the shoulder. But he actually ended up taking off running. Yep. And I, I meant, again, just missed him twice on the run emptied out my magazine and pulled another round out but could tell he was hit oh yeah no question the other two ran off he got up on the skyline and what was interesting is he got up on the skyline and stopped mm -hmm. and that's when you could tell okay he's he's probably hit good he went over the skyline then he came back over yeah. back to us that's when he kind of did his roll and yeah slammed really him one more time it. and yeah dropped him down which is super cool i mean i think it was like seven o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. you know basically what it what ended up being our last day of hunting which we didn't think was going to be but was which probably ended up being a good thing based yeah. on all everything we learned after the fact but you know we got we got that one down and got up there to him and um, took some awesome photos on top of the ridge line had the guides come up bring the horses up and uh, again just kind of had a cool cool little experience on top of the mountain um, with your second ibex down when well, it was uh, so great because it was on the top of the mountain literally literally yeah like, and it, it made such great photo opportunity you know yep. the approach to that ibex for me was it was pretty intense it was pretty emotional you know it was completing a bucket list item for me as far as hunting goes and yep you know really getting to be like all right i've i've dreamed about this moment and I have completed this task that I was doing for myself. And uh, it really felt great. Man. Yeah. I recall a little emotion at one point on that shot. Yeah. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. I, I was there. Yeah. I, both at, <laughs> after the shot and also up at the Ibex, too. Yeah. Um, Justin, I think you captured some pretty cool pictures of us during that time. But Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, both good. Got up there and... The guides went around. They brought the horses around up to the to the saddle. No, they brought them all the way up to us. Yeah, they brought them up where that saddle was, and then they came up over and down and came right to us. Yeah. yeah. Got that thing squared away, and 
as what luck would have it, we're sitting there doing that and look up on top of a mountain. And there's what another, see? was yeah. it like 10? There was another, there was, there was another group of three that crossed over, which, or excuse me, four total, because those end up being the four that, that came down. There was four, but there was another eight up there that we saw later. Mm-hmm. Could have been a part of that 11 somehow, or who knows? But there was, a, in that group of four, there was a couple really, really nice, you know, size billies in there that, I mean, the guides were looking at them through our spotting scope saying, you know, they're just giving you that that universal sign, right? So after we got yours all taken care of, we went back to the saddle, had a quick bite to eat. Actually, we went down the mountain, got to the bottom. Um, actually, no, we, we got to the saddle, had a bite to eat. Then we got down to the bottom, and that's where we dropped horses and kind of set up this drive, if you will, um, where one of the guides is going to try to get around and push those ibex down the canyon and uh, try to give us an opportunity which um, that canyon stretch though is is a mile and a half oh easy maybe two miles from where he Over. was in the other valley on the backside to where we ended up being yeah i mean part of that was snow tops a glacier and that glacier was probably like 40 50 60 feet deep i mean it was insane just the the setup and what was even crazier is how everything kind of worked almost to a T and what they what they actually were, were trying to do. And uh, we walked up. So the three of us went with the other guide and kind of walked back up into an area um, where just below where a large glacier was. And we got set up and um, our guide actually ended up leaving us. And he went down and his comment to me was, is he was going to stay lower than us and if the ibex crossed us he was going to try to push them back in our path that was his intent which left the three of us alone which was kind of back to that conversation we had earlier and uh, we were sitting there the four of us were sitting there all of a sudden i look up through my scope and i see those four billies i mean it's crazy you're looking at a mountaintop and you see a little rock outcropping and a bunch of snow and then you see them like visibly with your naked eye yeah you know and they're on top of the world and they started moving which kind of told me that uh, our other guide had probably gotten in there and, and, and moved him out, moved him around a little bit. As those four were coming down, kind of that spine of that ridge, eight more crossed the top, mm-hmm. and they crossed right across in the snow. Yeah. And I was watching them running through the snow. It was, just, it was just amazing watching those animals and how they can move through that topography and that those mountains like it's just nothing. And uh, so anyway, long story short, that group band of four came off that ridge, and literally it was like clockwork. They were falling right into our lap, and uh, our guide moved away from us. Uh, Justin was set up with the camera, and Andy, you were set up with my binos, and you started giving me ranges, and you started at around 500 yards, and every 15, 20 seconds as they were moving closer, you were giving me yardage, and I don't remember at one point, they were around like 320, 330, and, and that Billy stopped, and you're like, hey, he stopped. He's like 320, 317 or something. And in my mind, I'm like, well, if they keep moving to me, I'd rather take a 200-yard shot than a 300-yard shot. So I was just adjusting the turret. Every time you'd give me yardage, I'd look at the turret, and I'd just turn it down, turn it down, and I was taking yardage off. And finally, um, that Billy got to around, I think 270 is what the yardage was. I set the turret at 275. And uh, he didn't stop. He was just kind of slow walking slash trotting when I took the first shot. And, again, don't know what happened. Blatantly missed. Um, And the problem is after you take the first shot, it's like jailbreak with those things, right? They just, they move. So you grab me and you're like, hey, we got to get closer. So we went up and closed the distance. um, Which we're running across the tops of the boulders. Literally, like running and Justin's got his big camera, and, and uh, so we did. We got up to a point where I found a rock that I felt comfortable shooting under and uh, set the rifle up on the rock, and uh, we waited, and we were hoping they were going to cross in front of us, which they did. In that little in that little ravine right yep. there, they were going to cross on that far side. Exactly. Thinking, yeah. okay, they got to run through these rocks and boulders. Now, they can move pretty good in them, but they're, they're not, like, crazy fast, yeah. you know, so it'd give me an opportunity. You arranged it, it was like 250 yards. I'm like, perfect. Well, they didn't come that way. They ended up going 
farther out, and then they ended up going up that draw. But I spotted the one, and I said, hey, straight across, like straight, straight, straight across, and you looked and, and ranged around 400 yards. Yeah, I think it was just, 400 flat. Yeah. I think I set the turret one click past, past 400 and uh, it was that second shot, and you said, yeah, it's the lead one. He's right at 400. And I remember looking through the scope, seeing him, and he was literally running away with a slight quarter to the right. And I, for the life of me, not sure how I made the shot, but I squeezed off and put one. Dumped literally, him. literally, it skinned his front shoulder. And went, and went his neck. right into his neck <laughs> and blew out the other side. And when I heard that flop, I knew I'd hit him. And... Uh, you guys are looking you're like he's down like he's done and the other three went up on the hill and um, yeah and our guide ended up running up and he was just ecstatic like because he brought my vinyl case that had extra cartridges in it i was didn't even wasn't even thinking i had still two in my pocket but um yeah dumped him dumped him right in his tracks and uh it was pretty exhilarating because all my shots I didn't have a one kill shot. I didn't have a first kill shot. Every shot I took, my first shot was like a warning shot. <laughs> yeah. I was like, let me get him going first. Like, hey guys, I'm here. Yeah. Which is like the worst thing you can do. But um, yeah, second shot, just piled them up. And uh, I was I was shaking again, like after the shot, my hand was still shaking. Just because of the events that happened, how everything happened so fast and kind of the stress of all the situation. But it was pretty awesome because we walked up to him, he was, he was a good Billy. I mean, he was definitely one of the two in that back, that group that were good size and, you know, just totally grateful for that opportunity to have that and uh, make the shot. And because uh, I, you know, who knows what happened if I would have missed that shot. We would have got on them. We'd have been up on the mountain another day. Who knows? Well, it started snowing when yeah. we were skinning out that Billy. Skin, you know, snowing and, <clears throat> and raining. And so... I think it was just meant to be for that one to get smacked and hammered like it was. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. And now, by the time we got back down to the horses, we were kind of under the impression that we were going to be staying up that night. Correct. And then head down the next morning. And the guides were like, no, 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 we're leaving. We're leaving tonight. Yeah. So we went all the way down to our first camp, picked up the the heads first, and stuff that yep. we had left behind yep. and started our adventure down the ravine. <clears throat> Which is definitely an adventure. Yeah. Because coming up, I had a few spots where I was a little puckered, you know. But uh, coming down, we basically walked for a good portion of, the, of it down just because there's so much... The canyon gets so tight, you got all that shale and you've got the river crossing in there, the creek crossing, and it's just, the rocks are really slick, and um, you just, I don't know, I'd rather take that, I'd rather take the risk and walking and trying to get across on a horse slipping and that stuff and getting washed down, and you, I mean, it'd be, it'd be a bad, be a bad outcome if, if that's what would have happened, but um, yeah, just kind of going back to, when we got back to the horses after um, I shot that one, it was kind of fun because that was kind of our last you know that was our last animal and they started breaking out schnapps and we made a lunch <laughs> there and it just it was just a fun, again kind of that last gathering that last meal on the mountain with them and our guides it was just a lot of fun to, to share that moment with them yeah so yeah and, and you trekked it man you trekked all the way back to the main river on yeah, foot I did that just, was a hike. I kind of got just a rhythm, and I was like, you know what? I'm as fast or quicker on my feet. I was pulling a horse down, and I just kind of got, I don't know, sometimes you just get in that zone, and it was all downhill, so it wasn't like it was, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, exertion. But sometimes I just like to be on my own feet, you know, versus on a horse. Now, going uphill is a little different, but, um, yeah, I just I kind of had that time to myself to come off the mountain and really reflect on, our last few days and then the other thing that was incredible was just as you go down the mountain you look off to your left and you just see all those mountains and canyons filled with snow it's just like surreal yeah coming out of that canyon um just a i mean breathtaking place i mean there's a lot of places in the world that are beautiful but it's hard to put a hard to put a I would say a footnote on how beautiful that area was we were in, you know, 
during that time. Well, and I would have never pegged Kyrgyzstan as a place that would take my breath away. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <clears throat> and what was pretty awesome is, I mean, Justin captured so much of that going out, coming in and going out, you know, that canyon that it's... Yeah, I can't wait to see the footage you got, Justin. Yeah, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be pretty amazing. <laughs> like you said, I was uh, didn't expect to go to Kyrgyzstan being uh, being as blown away as I was. It's uh, pretty incredible. Kind of from the first feet of our uh, first feet of our trip coming into that canyon, where that uh, that water's coming down that stream, kind of that V Canyon when we're driving in is uh, is pretty incredible. And that was kind of the start of the start of the wow factor for me. Yeah. You know, it took us an hour to get down, where it took us three hours to get up. We got yep. to the river. <laughs> Things got interesting again. And a whole new slew of problems happened because it was, what, 80 degrees on the hottest day? I think so, yeah. yeah. So it was 80 degrees at 12,000 plus. So we were baking in the sun, which means every single piece of snow on the entire mountain range was melting and baking in the sun as well. And it raised that river, I mean, a solid foot. Yeah. At and least. A, and it, it made it move it much quicker, too. I yeah. mean, that water was just gushing. Yeah, and our craziest guide was, he was the daredevil. He was like, he's like, I'm going to be the first one to go across this and see how it goes. And he dropped some of the gear and started trying to cut across with Justin's little pony. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he lost the pony and almost got washed down himself. Yeah. Which, I mean, the water was coming up, up to his knees at least. I think there was a time where the water was like, at least I know on the one horse, the horse, the one horse had him been swimming. Because all the, the other stuff was, was floating, sure. and uh, his head was above water, but everything else was pretty much below water. So, yeah, I was, I was, I was worried a little bit for him and the other horse, you know, because I'm thinking, well, all our gears on the other horses, how the heck are we going to get across? Yeah, seven o'clock, dark in an hour, like we're kind of at a <laughs> pivot, pivotal point here. Yeah. But uh, in true, uh, in true fashion, those guys figured it out, got away where we got across and um, had to go upstream a little bit, but it was quite a bit shallower and we still got a little bit wet, but not nothing nearly what it would have been. Yeah, thank God for those, uh, for those hockey bags. Yeah. Keeping everything dry. Yeah. You know, that was a big plus. But so, yeah, it was cool. We got across and it was kind of our last ride back to camp. It was kind of a slow trot. Our horses were slow trotting in and yeah. it was dark. And they knew they were going home. Exactly. They knew they were going home. Yeah. They were excited. We were, had a little music playing. Everybody was just hooting and hollering. It was kind of a cool scene when we rolled into camp because there was a whole lot of people there and I'm not sure they were expecting us to be there. They weren't expecting us back at all. Yeah. And when we got in, it was like, it was kind of like that, that scene and like, uh, I don't know, like in a Indiana Jones when he like comes into the village and everyone just storms the village. Yeah. They all come and grab the Ibex. They go and they sit them on the thing and immediately they all start measuring them. I mean, it wasn't, and they were all, you could hear them like talking about them and they were sitting right outside where the chow, where the, uh, the food, the food cookhouse was, but immediately started measuring each one of them. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just cool to see their reactions and they were pointing and talking and, and, you know, we couldn't understand a word they were saying, but how excited they were when we rolled into camp was pretty cool. Yeah, that one guy who was there, the warden, who we had met when we got there, and he ended up staying the whole time until yep. we came back. What a gnarly old dude. Yeah. What a gnarly old guy, man. Yeah. Yeah, he worked for the Department of, uh, of Government job, I'm assuming, but he was, uh, yeah, he was like kind of the local warden. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, he was in the middle of it, measuring them, and, and uh, of course he was he was giving us stuff and crap about hiking up the mountains. And he's a smoker, and he says he could sm get to the top of the mountain. And he's a big Marco Polo hunter, so yeah, kind of a kind of a gnarly old guy. But um, 
I'll, yeah, just, I'll smoke a cigarette while I climb up. Yeah, exactly. And I'll still exactly. beat you. <laughs> so it was cool. We got back. We met back up with Mike. And then we come to realize what Mike had done on his hunt, which is pretty big spectacular in itself. Yep. How big was his? The biggest side was 141 and the small side was, was 139. 29 and 30 was the Was it 29 size. and yeah, it was 30? 129 oh, okay. and 30, I think, is okay. what he shot. But nonetheless, I mean. It was the record for the area. It was the biggest Ibex they'd taken in that area in quite a long time that they recalled. So, uh, yeah, and his hunt, I mean, they camped basically at the base, went up one day, and he found that band, and he shot that one. He was done basically day in a day and a half. Yeah. yeah. Um, and had just come back to camp and hung out. The owner of the uh, concession had showed up. Uh, Durig and uh, you know he was taking Mike out doing some stuff and they were kind of waiting on us when we got bu- got back to camp it was kind of like chop chop it was like okay you guys eat we'll talk about what we're going to do later but they had to boil the four heads they had to prepare all the hides and everything and there was a lot of work to do and uh, but they did want to get us back to Bishkek the following day to get all the documentation scored away so it was kind of downside a little bit because it would have been nice to have a day at camp but it ended up working out probably better that way because we were able to get out a day early and, and uh, get back to Bishkek and get all the documents together and and, uh, and so forth and kind of have a day to just kind of kick it in Bishkek like we did it was a nice kind of a touring day that we had yesterday so yeah for time hit the karaoke bar oh my gosh <laughs> <laughs> getting after it lucas i'm telling you we were rolling with like we were rolling with money bags heavy that, hitting dudes that guy was like and I, and, I, and i think to to paraphrase the whole trip i mean there wasn't a, a time where we were not accompanied by somebody that could help translate articulate you know where we were going what we were doing like that to me was such a huge positive on this trip like a lot of guys get taken back to Bishkek, and it's like, drop the football, punt, here you go. You know, get back to the airport, figure it out. These guys came and picked us up. They arranged all of our documentation. They took us to a nice lunch. They took us back. I mean, like I said, there wasn't a point that we weren't stewarded or chaperoned, which sounds kind of like you're in fifth grade, but you know what? It was important to have those guys all the time. Well, not you know? only that, but he brought out his... Uh I want to say it was his brother-in-law, who's former military, big dude, you know, and, and he was, you know, the personal bodyguard for the trip, which, funny, I was having breakfast, and this crew of guys comes in who obviously were somebody, and they were escorted by a bodyguard when they came in, and I thought that he was one of the guys that had been in our trip, and I waved at him, and he's like, I don't know you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then come that. to find out. You know, when we go downstairs, it was his brother-in-law who's whatever that group of guys was. He's their personal security. Correct. You know, so it was it was nice, man. It was comforting to know that, like, these guys 100 percent every step of the way were trying to take care of us. Yeah. And that goes from the start of the trip till the minute we left to get on the airplane to come here. I mean, they were there to pick us up, to greet us, to get us through everything. And we're there at 2 in the morning, dropping us off, making sure we got through security, making sure you got all, through all the, the hoops you had to jump through with the rifle. Oh, God. I mean, that just goes to show. And I'm getting texts from Chingas when we were on the airplane. Did you guys make it okay? Have you seen Andy? Like, again, I, I can't stress enough. Getting treatment like that, that's not normal. No, it's that's not. not the nor- that's, that's the exception, not the rule with these kinds of trips. And... Uh, it just goes to show the the quality of what they provide, and and I hope that they continue to keep it at that level because mm-hmm. people will come to that, right? People oh, yeah. want that, you know. That's the experience everyone wants to pay for. Exactly, you know. To um, so just, I mean, can't say enough about how much they really made a kind of, I would say, a personal commitment to make sure we had a great experience and. Um, Again, it started from the minute we got to Bishkek till the minute we got on the plane to leave. Yeah. You know, they really helped us out, and uh, it was pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't change it at all. I mean, 
for anybody that's coming, I would anyone that wants to do a trip like this, I would I would definitely say check your paperwork. Be very clear with whoever you're organizing it with how many rounds of ammunition you can bring, what paperwork you need. You know, do you need to bring cash? Do you need to bring card? Do you need to bring check? Yeah. You know, like there was there was a couple of hiccups we had which wasn't on their end. You know, I don't think at all. No. Um, but there was there were some hiccups that we had on things that needed to get figured out. Yeah. Um, because of uh, error in communication. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And part of that was is you know we kind of went through a booking agent essentially who's helping trying to market there. You know the, these guys, I mean they confessed to us we don't have, we don't know how to market in the U.S. Right. Yeah. We just don't know what the market is so. You know, they were using a booking agent, and the communication wasn't very, very well with that with that booking agent on but, their end and on our end. Yeah. yeah, but now we have the direct contacts, and you know, know how to know in the future how to you know make it to where it's more seamless. But again, it's details. I mean, that that was a part of it. That yeah, that's some feedback we can provide to make their their process better. But in general, that didn't overshadow all the goodness of what yeah. our week of you not know, in the slightest. Yeah, not at all our week of living out some dreams yeah i mean just still crazy going back through photos looking at all of that you know and just yeah justin over here just crushing out photo editing <laughs> that every, the whole trip back to yeah. Bishkek, he's just like a machine just staring at the phone man it's uh it's what i love yeah it is he did a great job i you know for the listeners that listen to this i mean check out Justin's Instagram page. His photos are incredible, and, and the work that he did on this trip, he captured so many things that I didn't know he did that when I go back and look at him, I'm like, man, that is just such an awesome photo. You know, we haven't even seen any of the video. Yeah. All we've seen and we haven't even seen all the photos. We've just seen the ones that he's cherry-picked out so far. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So. Yeah. I'm excited to put it all together for you guys. I'm just glad you're able to join us on this journey, and that'd be cool to document all of this into some type of a film that we can look back on in years to come and, you know, share with all our friends or, you know, any of our family. And it would be pretty exciting to see that. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. What would you think of the horse meat? Not too, uh, not too big of a fan. I, uh, I've been in the restaurant more than I've liked after eating the horse meat. Do you think that's the reason? I don't think that's the it's reason. It's got to be something, man. It's uh, It's been an issue on this trip. <laughs> Let's just say that. <laughs> You're not feeling too hot. <laughs> no. <laughs> but that's been the whole trip kind of for you. Exactly, exactly. But I, I got uh, to say the, the T-bone. The horse T-bone was amazing. I wish I would have left room for that. Yeah. Because there were so many courses. We had like a six course meal. <laughs> oh. By the time that came out, like, I thought they already brought out a dessert, and then they bring out these big platters with these giant T-bone steaks that were actually really good. Yeah. The meat was really good, but I could not make myself eat anymore. And context, we went to a what appeared to be a pretty high-end, nice um, restaurant, if you will. And what we, was it called? Sephora? Sapporo, I think. Yeah. Or Sephora. Yeah. yeah. And... Uh, just a cool place. We kind of sat in this outdoor kind of covered area. We sat on cushions, and um, and we had um, Nurik did all of the ordering, and, and he ordered everything because the menu was pretty foreign to us. But I mean, we we literally probably had a spread for ten people, easy. And there was five of, five, of five of us there. I mean, <laughs> yeah, five of us. So much food, and uh, but yeah, the kind of the main courses were all dealt with you know horse with different types of horse meat and then horse milk and uh, so yeah it was uh you know it's it's kind of neat to get immersed in their culture and their and what they eat and, and their foods but some of it i agree some of it i had a hard time looking at and saying you know i'm just probably like not. the lamb liver i tried yes. that that was rough i took a bite that was rough that's mm-hmm. as far as i got there's a couple of, there was one one sausage slice or something that went, that was on my plate that looked yeah questionable um, questionable <laughs> yeah. yeah Justin got a little horse milk but did couldn't get past couldn't the first sip huh no it's uh, how do you explain that stuff I don't know I didn't drink it 
Because there was alcohol in it. Yeah. Basically I, fermented milk. <clears throat> I mean, it does I, have a little bit of alcohol. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was super appreciative of how respectful they were to the fact that I don't drink. You know, they, they were totally respectful to that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess the only way I could explain, like, as a kid I grew up, I mean, I drank warm cow's milk. I mean, my, my mom would literally go and, and, uh, and get milk every morning for us for, like, cereal from cows, and it was warm. It was like... If she had milk a cow and there was a lot of milk, it would sit in the fridge for, like, the next day it was cold, but that was, like, a rarity. But it reminded me of drinking, like, warm cow's milk as a kid, but it had a, an interesting, like, aftertaste to it. And there was also, like, like little, like, black, like, pepper, like, flake clover, like, little pepper flakes in there, like, floating, too. Like, it just, I took two rounds of it, and, um, yeah, I'm sure at some point I'll be paying for that, too. Haven't yet, <laughs> fortunately. Still got another four hours on the plane, but um, yeah, just interesting. And it, it, as you watch the natives there, they drink it like it's just they love. They can't it. get enough of it. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So, um, but it was cool. It, it was cool to experience that. It was the post hunt activities. It was cool to drive around Bishkek, go do that. Like I say, we came back. What a neat city. Yeah. I was actually blown away by how cool the city was. I like it more at night than during the daytime, but, yeah, you know. Yeah, it was fun. I mean, we went, like I say, went to a bar, did some karaoke, and uh, walked around a little bit. Just a a really neat place, about a million people. Uh, Would have been cool to maybe have another day there and take it all in, but I think all of us were at the point of saturation and kind of ready to get home yeah i think we were also just kind of ready to bail out that hotel sure was nice yeah i don't think i've ever stayed in a hotel that nice sheridan was super nice yeah uh, you know we got recommended to stay at the hyatt the hyatt was twice as much as the sheridan was and we literally had front door service of anything we needed we had you know um we had marble bathrooms yeah i mean it was (laughs) it was nice I think we were talking about that, weren't we, Justin? COVID test right to your door. I mean, yeah. Yeah, how crazy was that? I didn't expect that to show up knocking on the door like, oh, PCR or PRC test yeah. or whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, it is super easy. Yeah, yeah, like everything was just super nice. And, uh, again, kind of goes back to the pre- and post-hunt activities. I mean, we were literally treated like royalty there, you know, picked up, done this, got COVID test right at our door. I mean, it just... I don't know. There are things like that we don't even get in the States, yeah. you know. So, Well, one thing when I was dealing with all that bullshit at the airport today, or I guess last night, whenever it was, it was a while ago now, uh, the head guy and the head lady kept being like, American, American, talking to everybody else, like, American, American, we have to make sure this works. We have to get this guy through. He's an American. He's an American. And I was, like, kind of blown away by that because it's like, wow, I didn't realize that, yeah. you know, just being an American give us gives us that much more respect while we're out there. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, having, you know, Alton and Chinga's there, too, I mean, they, I think they mediated a lot of stuff we didn't even see happening. Right? Oh, yeah. They were just, like kind of the middle guys talking to the military guys you were going through with customs and imagine us doing that on our own you like, know and i've done that i've had to i've been in that position it's very uncomfortable yeah because you can't understand them oh when they had me in the room with my gun and and they closed the door behind me and it's me and the military guys if chingas wasn't there i would have been sweating i know like terrified because Justin and I were in line trying to get us all checked in, and I kept looking over there just out of curiosity, what's going on? And I remember the one time I saw the door closed, and I saw, like, the police guys come in, like the blue. Yeah. Look, the blue the hats? Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, oh, this is not good. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. And we're checking in, and they're like, okay, where's uh, where's Andy at? I'm like, oh, he's, he's over. And they're like, oh, okay. So they knew, like you were with us and yeah. somehow I don't know if it was in the system or what but Justin and I were able to get checked in minus your bags and um, got our got our seats and flights through to, to LA so that that was reassuring to me because I wasn't able to check in online for us and, and uh, I was a little concerned 
but it was everything you know once we sat down you could finally take a deep breath but it was it was a little uh it was a little nerve-wracking for a while there yeah. in the airport when we were checking in for sure yeah well i felt a little bit better when the hnic looked at me and i was like hey man like we're gonna miss our flight if we don't speed this up and he looked at me and he's like as long as i'm here that plane's not leaving without you and i was like oh okay cool it's yeah. like we're we're all right but you were probably one of two or three of the last people on the plane but yeah. you got on so yeah i got on five minutes before we were supposed to leave the gate yeah Ugh. stress yeah it's a lot of it yeah on all different levels yeah, and I tell you, some of these outfits that provide firearms, you, know, you really think about it. You know, it's like a lot of these outfits do. They have weapons, and they'll let you, you know, use them. But there's nothing like having your own rifle there. I get it. Mm-hmm. But when you think about it, t- traveling without one sure seems pretty nice, too, at the same time. Yeah. It's you got to balance it out. Yeah. You know? And it, everything worked out. Yeah. Um, and we're a few hours from L.A. and we'll be back in the States. It'll be nice to be back on on U.S. soil. But, man, just thinking about our trip, it was pretty dang incredible. Pretty awesome experience. Yeah. Uh, definitely one I'll remember for a long time. <clears throat> yeah, I can't wait to get back to my own bed. What is that? A bed? I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a novel concept. It is. It really is. Oh. It'll feel good, man. It'll feel good. What do you think? Any 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 final thoughts? Any comments or anything about it? Um, you know, like I said, I was just kind of reflecting and putting down my notes, opportunities for them, and then pluses. And I tell you, I was so overwhelmed with the good things that came out of this. And there are some things I thought about, like they probably need to have a nice shooting range, like. Have some benches, set some targets up. Like, that's an easy thing for them to fix, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I had a little feedback around, you know, kind of make sure hunters understand coming in. What do they need to have, you know, deposits? What do they need to have? You know, so all, all that stuff will be figured out, and they'll get better with that. But Well, in their first, this is their first year. We were their first hunters Ever. coming in, you know. Yeah. So, um, so there's some learnings there. But overall, I mean, I, you know, I think kind of my comment was is I've you know I've, I've hunted in a few places out of the or internationally and I've never been treated like this I've never had that level of, of customer service and um, them literally you know wanting us to, to have a great experience and, and for that I you know I feel grateful that I came because I was on the fence of even coming yeah. you know and probably the best thing that I could have done was do this trip um, and you definitely go with you guys. were on the fence I was, for sure. Like, <laughs> you may have talked me back on over the other side of the fence along with my family. but um, And your boss, too. Yeah, my boss. But I'm so glad I came. Like, Way really, to swing back. Through the ups and the downs of the trip, everything about it, sitting here right now, like, it was freaking awesome. I mean, it's not, hard to explain it if, unless you were there, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. tell a lot of people our experiences but i think it's like anything until you go do it <laughs> it's hard to hard to translate it you know justin you saw it through your eyes not as a hunter but as a photographer but oh yeah even you've said it's pretty awesome just to be there to capture the moments for us so one of the most amazing trips i've been on so yeah do you have any final it. thoughts about it what do you what where are you at besides the bathroom i'd like to do it <laughs> i'd like to do it again yeah. I like to do it again, um, get a few people round up, and uh, try to make it happen for myself. I mean, like I said, I've only done one other international hunt, um, and this is even even back in the states, like Lucas was saying, this was like bar none. Um, just from start to finish, we were treated like royalty, and it just just made the trip that much that much better for sure. Yeah. So. Yeah, agreed. Pretty 100%. amazing. Pretty amazing. That last, uh, that last feet kind of coming off that mountain where the canyon kind of V's is uh, was pretty emotional for me. Just it was just cool to just finally take a step back from all like the sweat, 
tears, emotions running through the mountain, stress, and just kind of be like, dang, this is, uh, this is incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So. Soak it, at, soak it all in. Yep. Actually feel it. So, yeah. I'd recommend, uh, recommend anyone, anyone looking for an adventure to, uh, to do that hunt. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. It isn't easy. But it's worth it. Yes, it Definitely is. Definitely worth it. Yeah. It was a great time. Yeah. What about you, Andy? What's, uh, what do you, I guess, do you take away moving forward as a hunter or as a person? Or what, what do you, how I mean, do you glean from the trip? You know, like I, like I said before, this has been a, a, a long-term bucket list item that I never thought that I'd achieve in my lifetime. You know, I mean, there's still half of it left out there, which is fulfilling my Marco Polo dream, uh, which that'll happen. You know, I don't know when it'll happen, but it'll for sure happen. Um, But it was uh, not only a learning experience, but such a positive experience in the sense of like, anything that we want to do in our lives we can do it you know what I mean and and anything anywhere we want to go <clears throat> everything is achievable everything is attainable you know it's it's having the willingness to do it whether it's you know when I'm I'm looking forward 50 yards and you guys are crushing up a mountain and not stopping and I can hardly breathe and I'm struggling to keep up and struggling to get there you know, and but you know, I got there. Yep. Every time I got there, you know what I mean. Yep. And, and 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 sure, it happens in Western hunting, and you know the the stuff that I do on a more regular basis. But you know, being able to to take that and apply it into everything in life, and really understand that everything is achievable. Maybe it's going to be slower. Maybe it's going to be faster. Where everything is always going to be achievable, as long as you know we just keep our head down and keep going and keep trudging and 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 actually make it happen. Yeah, uh, and you did. I mean, you. I would kept telling you, man. It's not a you know, it's not a race. It's yeah. a marathon. And part of my part of my reasoning is sure. staying on those guys' hip pockets is I, I wanted to know what they were doing, what they were seeing, so I could help translate that mm-hmm. to you guys. Like, and staying on their hip pocket, I mean, I, it wasn't it wasn't hard for me. Like, I, and not to say that you know for everyone it's different, but it was easy for me to stay with them because that's the pace that I run anyway. But I was truly interested in understanding where they were going, what they were saying because I wanted to be able to translate that, especially for you as you were shooting, mm-hmm. staying with them, knowing, hey, we need to get you up here, right? Or I could range them and know, okay, this is a yard that you could shoot. Like, really just trying to make sure we had all the advantages on our side. Um, but you're right. I mean, you you made it. You did it. And, uh, yeah, it might have taken you 20 more minutes, but it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, you did it. Yeah. And, you know. Exactly. Uh, and that's that's the thing, it, you know. Everyone takes different paths in life, but if you all come to the same place, however you get there, it really doesn't matter if you get to that place. Yeah. You know, I shot two ibex, you shot two ibex. We went different paths, but we both shot two ibex. Yeah. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter how you got there. Yeah. So. Yeah, and I mean the experience overall is, you know, like what we were talking about, man. You're in one of the most beautiful places in the world. And the most unsuspecting place of that sort of beauty. Yeah. And, uh, you know, again, that's why that one night it was like, I'm going to sleep under the stars tonight, you know, and and really take that in and lay in my bag and just look up and contemplate. Yeah. And uh, decompress a little bit. I'll, I'll be honest. I told a lot of people I was doing this hunt, they're like, where the hell's what the hell's Kyrgyzstan? Why? <laughs> I'm like, well, the biggest ibex in the world live there. But other than that, you see photos. It's beautiful, but you can't you can't put that into words to someone. Even your photos, as good as they are, 
there's still Tough more to put it into perspective. There's still more sure. perspective, like you said, walking out. I kind of had that moment too, just walking out by myself, just like God, this has been incredible. You know, it's yeah. like our last run down the mountain, and it was pretty awesome. I can't um, wait to run up that mountain again, though. Like I'm, I, I know you were saying, you know, for your kind of one and done and and all that, and like. I look at that and I'm like, man, I, I can't wait to go do that again. Yeah. Whether it's there or somewhere else or a different species or whatever it may be, but like, I can't wait to go have that experience again. Yeah, it's, yeah. I think we're gonna. Uh, I think it goes for all of us. Those uh, the guides, kind of a plus. I'll uh, I'll miss them for sure. Oh yeah. Say after day two or three, they started opening up to us, and it's uh, we just kind of gelled and clicked together. And it, uh, yeah. Yeah ended up working out super 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 good guys yeah, yeah. big part of our success for sure yeah. was them <clears throat> definitely well well boys we're three and a half out from touch it down i'm gonna find another movie to watch justin's probably got another few more trips to the bathroom i think so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> poor guy poor guy i just want to say appreciate both of you guys for helping me convince me to come and, and also share this experience with me and hopefully the three of us can do it again if we never do I'll remember this the rest of my life though there's no question that this is one of the most memorable hunts I've ever been on yeah. Heck yeah. And you guys made it made it awesome so I, I appreciate that yeah 100% and I mean you you almost single handedly organized everything as far as airfare and you know you have a travel agent that you work with that was able to line everything out and getting everything squared away with the uh, guy who was outfitting and yep. doing all the booking and all that kind of stuff. And now to come full circle through it, you know, is it would have been the same without you. Yeah, man. Yeah, you know, and like for me, <laughs> I keep thinking back to different conversations I've had with, with guys that have come out and hunt Ibex and. You know, one guy was like, "Yeah, man, you're not. No one's going to be able to keep up with the with the guides. It's not possible. No one could do it." And it was so funny during the hunt. I'm I'm trekking along, and I just look up, dude, and you're on their fucking heels, dude, <laughs> on their heels. And I just keep thinking to myself, like, how fucking cool is that? Like, how cool uh-huh. is that to just see somebody take off and get into it and be on their heels every day? non-stop like <laughs> your ability to just to crush it was so up there it was just for me it was unreal to watch and it was such an opportunity to get to watch it from you know starting to book it and getting everything squared away all the way until the hunt when you're like chasing these dudes around the mountain like nobody's business to when we're coming out and you're just like solo mission trekking all the way down the mountain <laughs> on foot like and I knew like watching you dude I just knew that you were thriving in your own element yeah you know thriving in your own devices having the time of your life enjoying yep. what was left of the hunt yep Absolutely. you know and it was just so cool and, and such a neat opportunity to get to watch you have those moments you know what I mean that's cool I appreciate that yeah Hopefully you guys take, you know, think little things like use a travel agent, like, and anyone listening, like, I've done enough of these to know trying to do what Mike was doing on his own, it's a pain in the ass. Yeah. I send one email, everything's taken care of, done, rebooked, like, that's just one of those things I've learned over time doing these, that, you know, little things like that, and, um, and I enjoy, I enjoy kind of setting everything up, making sure everything is set right, and it's just kind of the person I am, but, you know, I, it, yeah, I was... You're 100% right. I was in my element coming off the mountain. And uh, <laughs> they were trying to convince me, horse, horse, you know, they were doing this. I'm like, nope, nope. I'm walking, guys. This is where I'm at. But, yeah, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll end it there. He's out. If I can find the Peace. fucking button. He's got a flashlight. Got it. Ooh, the light. Ooh, Jesus, he that was spoken. such a fun light on the way. (laughs) 
Hey listeners, this is Lucas Paw, host of the RNA Outdoors podcast. Check out our website at rnaoutdoors.com to find all of our podcast platforms. Go listen today where you podcast. Additionally, leave a review and a five-star rating. These reviews help boost our popularity and outreach. You can also follow us on our social media outlets, Instagram at Rod and Arrow Outdoors, Facebook, RNA Outdoors, and YouTube, RNA Outdoors. All links are in the show notes as well. We hope you'll pass along our channel to your friends and colleagues. Subscribe today and follow along on the journey.